Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest this week is Aaron Deek. Aaron is a sales expert focusing on agency businesses. Aaron, welcome to the pod. Thanks, Spencer. Glad to be here. Glad to have you. So I have met Aaron on LinkedIn uh, through a series of comments that I thought were funny at the time and just reached out and we kind of made natural friends. And uh, we had a good conversation about sales where, you know, you had some good insights, Aaron. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, long story short, I came out to visit you in Texas and now we're doing the podcast. So, uh, yeah, appreciate you coming on. Um, good, good to see you again, man. Yeah, good to see you too. Glad to be here. Um, I, yeah, I thought it was interesting. I've done a lot of work with uh, software agencies particularly and like getting to know you and how you're, you essentially run an agency business. Oh, yeah. Uh, and but it's in a different field that i'm uh have a history with but it's nice to see kind of how a lot of the same principles are at play oh they, they uh, are yeah no and, and that's what i found really interesting about our initial call is some of the stories you were telling about just sales work you did in software it's it's totally applicable to what ska does and i mean it's it's pretty apples to apples which you know the the engineer in me and the roboticist in me wants to say like you know, well, no, robotics is its own thing. It's totally unique. But then it goes back to that sales adage, which, like, I think it's in, like, a, I can't remember if it's a Zig Ziglar book or if I read it in a Jeffrey Gittimer book or something else. But it's, like, two guys are at, like, a expo for, you know, refrigerated or frozen food. And they're, like, do you have, you know, experience selling, you know, refrigerated or frozen food? And the one guy goes, well, yes, I do. And he goes, uh, peas? Well, absolutely. I've done that before. And he goes... Um, individual or in pods? <laughs> and obviously the moral is that, you know, it doesn't matter. And, you know, it's, it's more the same than different. And so that's, that's why I was getting at that. For sure. Absolutely. I mean, it is, you know, there's a, a process of bringing in your sales, your potential customers doing the mutual vetting, kind of going through the process. I find particularly with owners of agencies, you're finding that, one of the big priorities for people that run an agency like yourself are going to be saving your own time and making your own life better, uh, which that, which kind of doesn't translate to larger organizations. Um, if that makes sense. I think so. Yeah. Well, I mean, the idea is that if you say yes to a high maintenance account, basically, you know, you're saying no to potentially like three lower maintenance accounts. So. Absolutely. I mean, we've all been there where you, you, you know, you, you let in, as, as I put it, the customer from hell and you know, they, they do just that. They make your life miserable and you regret it and you end up being a lot more selective the next time you encounter similar red flags in a sales call. Totally. Yeah. I think it's important. A lot of clients come and sit to me and say, Hey, we need more, we need more customers. And it's like, no, you need more good customers. And, <laughs> If you can do 10x what you're doing right now, how many more bad customers are you going to be scaling out without figuring out how to prevent them from even coming into the funnel or, you know, getting them out of the funnel as quickly as possible? Oh, yeah. So you don't get into a situation where it's just not worth uh, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. Yeah, it makes sense to me. Well, and I've been there. I mean, one of the first jobs that SK ever did was with a company. And I won't give too many details so people can't ID them because I'm going to talk some shit. And so what I would say is um, one of our early clients I, I learned a lot from, we agreed to do um, basically a lot of work for free uh, on speculation of our customer making money on the product we engineered for them. And, you know, at the time that seemed really good because, you know, if we do a good job, they should be able to sell our work and we should see a reward. But what that didn't take into account is, you know, the motivation of the team that wasn't getting paid any money that was having to wait 
in order to do it. I mean, this was me like right out of grad school. I, I, I really didn't know any better. And I learned a lot from it. I mean, I also agreed to kind of a nebulous work scope, which was, you know, a big no-no because now I'm beholden to deliver, you know, an infinite amount of stuff basically because the scope was so open-ended that I got bent over a barrel. And so, you know, it was a, it was a huge lesson learned. I mean, I learned sort of certain red flags to look out for when somebody's trying to maneuver you in that way. I learned, um, you know, things that I should be saying no to, you know, I mean, if there's goodwill in a relationship, you know, I don't think somebody's going to do that to another, you know, group of people, but there's not always goodwill in a relationship. And so, you know, that's, that's kind of why I tell that story. 100%. Yeah. I think of it as like, um, there's people that should work with you and should not work with you. There's people that could work with you and could not work with you. And the goal of any sale, the first, the first and continued question in a sales and account management type uh, relationship is, should they and could they? And if they, if they could but shouldn't or they should but couldn't, there's no point, right? If, 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 if what you have is exactly what they need but they could never afford you, don't waste your time. Yeah, correct. If all the money in the world, but they really don't need what you're selling. Don't, don't waste, waste their it. time. <laughs> yeah, but if they, you know, yeah. And being honest about it to people builds respect and appreciation. I completely but, agree. I mean, you know, something down the line happens where they it's time to call you and they know they can trust you because you didn't try to, you know, nickel and dime them or, or dick them around in any way. A hundred percent. No, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I think for me, you know, when I've, you know, quote, been sold on certain things and, and, you know, the approach that is endearing to me is, is exactly what you just said. It's when a salesperson acts as an advocate and, you know, sits on the same side of the table, literally and figuratively, and looks out for my best interests in a way where, and, and also understands what they're selling and has taken the time to, you know, become, you know, an actual expert on the thing it is that they're pushing forward. So if I know they're honest, I know they know what they're talking about. I know they're not going to dick me around as you put it. You know, I mean, I want to give that person all my business. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. So I was talking to a client of mine. Um, they run a, an agency. They have about 200, 300 people um, throughout Eastern Europe. And they realized what, what they had learned their big takeaway from working with, working with us was, they stop telling the story of their own agency and their self, right? They, because they're very proud. They've come a long way from being five dudes. Now they have hundreds of people working for them. Uh, and they kind of would, they would lead with their strength as an organization. Whereas now they're like, we get into a sales call and the client is telling us all of this stuff. So then on the next call, when we come in to tell them what all we can do based on the discovery in the first call, present them what they're looking for and then back it up with the fact that, Oh yeah, we are all, we also are a sophisticated and mature organization in our own right. Um, and that way they're not spending all their juice. You know, you think about how juiced up you get talking about how successful your agency has been. Um, if you did that with every, what's it? Uh, Jack, Joe and Shirley or whatever. Then, uh, <laughs> I don't know. How, I don't know. What Jack, Joe, and Shirley. I love that. <laughs> Yeah, for every, every one of them that came by knocking on your door, you're going to just like blow all your energy out. Like it's, it's fun the first thousand times. Um, but after that, it's just like, it takes energy to be able to like really bring it. And so as a, from a sales perspective, you want to be able to figure out, get them talking. The goal is to get them to say shit so that, you know, this person's not worth my time. And you want to get them to say that before they think of you and say, this guy's not worth my time. Interesting. You know? Yeah, I was like, I want to break up with you before you break up with me. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, it, or it could be like this person is totally worth my time, and you know, I know because well, and, and you figure that out by trying to eliminate all the reasons they might not be. Right? Is this person a schmuck? Do they have money? You know, do they have a clear idea of what they want? Does it seem like we have a natural ability to communicate? If all of those things are true you've made it past the minefield and it's like, cool, let's uh, send me over your designs and talk to me about like, you know, where you're hoping to come in for budget, blah, 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 and move along down the path. But it, having the minefield up front enables you to just pick off the people that aren't the golden opportunities 
and then either refer them somewhere else or say, give me a call in six months or whatever. So you're not spending your time on it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I do love referring, um, you know, just non-qualified prospects to, to people that can help them. Like that does make me really happy. Because, you know, it feels like closure. <laughs> like, yeah, and everybody appreciates it. Yeah. You know? And it's like you don't need to get get paid for it, you know? Like I, I said I said referrals to people, like SEO people hit me up a lot. Someone came to me looking for SEO. I said, you know what? I talked to this guy once. He was cool. You should talk to him. And the guy hit me back. He's like, let me get you on our, in our referral program. And I said, no, man. Like, I'm happy to – you seem like a good guy. I'm happy to pass a good person in your direction, you know? If I go, uh, you know, you asked me for a good re- recommendation for a steakhouse. Um, it's not going to be fair if I'm getting tipped out for you showing up, you know? Yeah, yeah, for I sure. My heart. And you can really leverage that. People like to be a, a resource like that, to be able to hook up people with a good referral. And it goes both ways. Yeah. Does that mean you wouldn't take a referral bump, though? Or, like, I feel like... You know, well, at I mean, a certain point. I mean, you know, it's like if somebody is like, like for instance, people come to me for software development a lot. I've worked in the field of software development. Yeah, they you know they come to me. I can help them navigate the opportunity, the options, set them up with the right development agency to, or contractors to do the work. Yeah, right. For that kind of thing, I'll take a cut depending on where I'm sending it. For kind of like um, curating, okay, based on what you need, these are the types of agencies or options you should go with. And here are the people I can personally vouch for. Yeah. Well, and I feel the same way about that. Like, I, I don't feel bad taking a referral bump if it's a qualified referral where it, the entity I'm referring to is, is right for the customer I'm referring to or the prospect I'm referring to that entity. For sure. And, and I'll say in most cases, the types of people that come to me come to me because they don't want to deal with someone offshore. So I effectively project manage for them. So that they're just like, I need this done, and then I'll handle it offshore and uh, bring it back to them delivered. Well, that's awesome. Well, that sounds like more than just a referral, though. I mean, if you're functioning as a point of contact and a project manager, I mean, that's that's a hell of a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, it varies. I mean, it doesn't take a, a ton of work, more just kind of being able to um, bridge the gap between. Yeah. I, I work with a lot of very non technical clients. Oh, interesting. I only really work with technical clients. So that is, that is when I say interesting, I actually mean it. Yeah. So, I mean, I live out in a small town. So a lot of the clients, I mean, one of our, one of my clients has like, they had the first phone number in the area in the third, <laughs> five digits. Holy crap. Yeah. Was this uh, in Elgin or somewhere else? Yeah, here in yeah. Elgin. Nice. Uh, you know, but, but they're not, I mean, they're, they have incredible amount of, uh, um, expertise I mean, the intellectual property they've you know patented and, and have the design um on tons of crazy shit but they're not the kind of people that can like build out a wordpress site yeah it makes sense you know so you're um, translating non-technical requirements into technical requir- effectively like desires into requirements is almost it sounds like what you're doing well i just need a website and they're like, you know, they go onto like the GoDaddy website builder. They're like, what would you like? It's like, give me a website. And there's not, there's not really much more granularity beyond that. So I'll kind of walk them through the process of um, understanding and, and, and quantifying what it is that they want. You know, user stories, things like that. Um, to understand what's going to be the, the, the the deliverable that I mean whether it satisfies them or not is one one thing. I need to make sure that I've got a checklist with ten things that can be verified with their five senses, and I can show them that the current website that I've delivered checks all of those ten boxes. If they don't like it, then they can pay me to fix it. But the agreement I make with them is that you know it will have quantitative features. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I, well, I yeah. think I think you mean like uh, features that can be verified against that checklist. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. It's not like it's, it's a requirements sleek. document. You're you're building requirements. But but I mean it's not like it's sleek. You know I just want it to be sleek, Aaron. Come on, like what the fuck does sleek mean? You yeah, know, it's, it's pretty like, nebulous. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, getting getting specific with the wording, um, and 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 then qualitative things like design. I tell them the only way I can do it for this price is if you give me total control over the design. 
I will make sure that it is objectively great. Doesn't matter what you subjectively think. I'll get your colors on there though. <laughs> and they're happy as a lark to not have to go back and forth about design things. Now, obviously in robotics, it's a little bit different. Well, that's one of the reasons why I seek out technologically sophisticated clients now. And so it used to be we would do business with um, you know individuals and companies that didn't really understand the technology but wanted you know something done and and it was fun because you know i i could come off as a wizard on the front end of the interaction because i knew how to do all that stuff and you know i'm like yeah we can do it. and but the problem with a, a non-technical client um that i i didn't realize when i first got into business uh in this business is that um the moment something goes wrong or you hit a hiccup or you have a, a natural lull in a project, I mean, it becomes a, a pretty serious lift to educate your customer that this is normal and it's part of the engineering process and it's nothing to worry about and we'll, we'll figure it out. And so, you know, there's, there's panic. Um, there's, um, I guess, uh, you know, doubt that you have to then combat and, you know, the, you know, they start to doubt you and your credentials as a professional if they're not experienced in, in what these projects are actually like to run. Because, you know, it's, it's like you look at, you know, movies and the way that, you know, the mad scientist or the, the you know, the R&D professional is portrayed. And it's, it's almost like it's magic. Like you look at like Tony Stark and Iron Man, for instance, you know, and. You know, there's all this crazy stuff going on and all the robots in Tony Stark's lab work and nothing, you know, you, you never, they never show Tony Stark, you know, with like an Ubuntu terminal open or like four Ubuntu terminals open that have to open in sequence to get a prototype robot to start up correctly. They don't, they don't show that scene in Iron Man, <laughs> you know, they don't, they don't show like, you know, what happens when it doesn't work the first time as it often does in, in early stage, you know, new product development, and, but you get a technologically sophisticated client that's overseen, you know, several complicated robotic products to market and, you know, understands, you know, the product life cycle and the engineering process and knows, you know, that this is an iterative process and, and it isn't always, you know, you don't win, 100% of the time, the first, I mean, you can get there all the time, but it takes patience and persistence and resources and, you know, just a deliberate concerted effort, you know, and as long as that's communicated across the table and all parties understand that, then there's no surprises when, you know, you, you have a little fire that happens that you can put out, but at yeah. the time it's a fire and it has to be put out. And so that's, that's what's caused me to sort of, pivot into seeking out, you know, highly technologically sophisticated clients. Effectively, we do our best work for other robotics companies that, you know, are bottlenecked horizontally and need some additional support. Got it. Yeah, it's, uh, I think managing expectations is really going to be the solution with non-technical people or people that don't know the process and, you know, the development process. You got to kind of hold their hand, but, but I also think that you know when you have a uh, some kind of problem, at least as they perceive it, it's always an opportunity to uh, gain a little more trust with them by solving the problem. Oh, that's interesting. So you have to just be patient with their, yeah. you know, their rage. Basically, you have to be like, "It's okay, we'll get through yeah. this." Not only that, no, it's like, "Thank you." for bringing this to our attention you know this not only was giving you terrible service or product or whatever but it could potentially be affecting more of our customers you know and, and our goal is to give you the best possible service and that this happened and that you brought it to us immediately is very helpful we're going to make this better and we appreciate you bringing it to our attention and that diffuses it most of the time and obviously they're going to be angry but it's like at the end of the day all we can do is move forward from this point. You know, it's like, I'm glad we had an opportunity to like, when push comes to shove and you got pissed off and we still came through, you know, yeah. like we, we leveled up our relationship. That's a good point. And I've had that happen um, before and, and work out for the better. Yeah. yeah. I, I think 
our friends in real life, you know? Yeah. The friends the friends that are our best friends are the You've ones that we have, we've been like, fuck you, buddy. Can I say that on the air? Yeah. Yeah, I think <laughs> yeah. it's fine. I mean, I say fuck on this podcast all the time. Cool. Cool. Well, yeah, those kind of people that you can make it past the point of no return and then come back and be friends again, it's a better relationship in my opinion. And, yeah. you know, and, and uh, likewise with a customer. And that's where it's just like where they think you're supposed to say sorry. You say, thank you for bringing it to my attention. <laughs> Thanks for letting me know. And, yeah. you know, and yeah. you, you can't be a smart ass about it. That's my, that's my problem. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's sincerely come from that place. It's like, wow, I'm going through a lot of emotions right now. But I want to say, first of all, thanks for letting me know. You know, thanks for calling me first kind of thing. Because at the end of the day, that's still the best possible outcome, even though it's a shitty situation. And so now you know and you can fix it. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, I, I think, yeah, at the end of the day, I mean, that's what I would want to hear if I was in that situation and something was going wrong by my perception. Yeah. Well, I think it's kind of the truth, you know. Well, and I've had I've had some of some of our best customers. I mean, I do love going into a panicked situation and being able to turn the panic into calm. Like there's nothing quite so satisfying as going into a situation that you're not sure if it can be solved and figuring it out and, and coming out, you know, in, in a good space. So Absolutely. I remember there's, there's one client we work with where um, when we started with them, it was just, a crazy timeline. They were trying to do a bunch of stuff and um, I'm, I'm being intentionally vague. So our client can't be identified here. Um, but they, they had some somewhat junior engineers on their team trying to do, you know, maybe moderately advanced things and they, they were not up to the challenge. And so, when I came in, like a lot of the senior managers were frustrated. They were angry at the engineers that had screwed up. Um, they were um, they were afraid. I mean, I think that's that's the emotion that was that was kind of prevalent is is fear. And I, I remember saying at the time because I sensed it. You know, I was like, "Don't worry, we'll figure this out." And the sense of calm, you know, kind of came across the room and you could see that the the person that was kind of talking quick and, and, you know, like, blah, 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 I don't know. And like, just kind of stopped and thought about it and was like, Oh, we'll figure this out. And then <laughs> there were times in the same relationship where I was a little bit afraid because, you know, we're, we're solving difficult problems and moving very fast. And, you know, it, it's, you're not always certain you're going to land if you jump, you know, because you're, you're, doing things that are very, very challenging. And, you know, the, the same person that I comforted, you know, came to me and said, don't worry, we'll figure this out. And so, you know, we built this camaraderie, yeah. you know, that's really been good. And, and, you know, not only that, but like, you know, just lucrative business arrangement and, you know, good for all parties involved. I mean, there's been just mutual benefit out of that relationship and, and it's been paying dividends. Yeah, that's the way it should be. It's like, you know, mutual benefit. It's the, you know, the should and could method. Where it's just, every, there's a place for all things. And if there's not a place for it, it's not going to be around for very long. Right? And it's just a matter of finding where it kind of syncs up, where it, all all parties benefit. I think it's like we're past the time of uh, just trying to scam people. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, you know, scams in history. <laughs> And now it's like with the internet, at least you can be like Google that shit and be like, yeah, that's a scam. That's too. a scam. <laughs> well, uh, you, get, you also like if, I think if you grew up with the internet as you and I did, you know, you you have a good spidey sense for for what a scam looks like. I mean, you you develop a pretty good bullshit detector. Oh and yeah. If, if somebody comes to you and says, you know, I'd like to send you some money, what's your bank account number? You say, um, go fuck yourself. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, just confirm your identity with your mother's maiden name and the last sixteen digits of your credit card number. Yeah, <laughs> the last sixteen digits. That's good. Work, you know, one in a million. Like, 
Wow, I mean, opening a Facebook account is really challenging these days. They want a lot of information. <laughs> yeah, I got Facebook, an email. Facebook, like B-U-C. Oh. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, well, there's been all kinds of scams, though, even before the internet. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, for the internet, like a great thing, like just a good kind of filter is like, look at the email address they're asking you to send stuff back to. And if it's like, you know, citizensbank at gmail.com, it's probably not citizens bank. And like, you know, like, or if it's id3.gnz.3dm hyphen xyp.com. Yeah. Uh, it's I, not, I, that's the no. first thing I look at now is the URL, right? I, I'm like, you know, what is the URL? And like, the, you know, they'll get clever and they'll do bit.ly, but you never get a you never get an email from your bank at bit.ly. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I, mean, I know people that are. I know this lady that works in tech and is you know pretty high up and was running to the bank to get a ten thousand dollar cashier check because there was a SWAT team about to raid her house where her kids were because she didn't pay her taxes in full. Oh, geez. And she's running before someone stopped her and said, hey, I don't think the IRS uses SWAT teams. (laughs) 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 Let's all just sit down and have a talk. The amount of executives uh, at a certain company I worked for that would put like one, two, three, four, five as their password, because I made friends with one of the IT people. And she was telling me that she's like, yeah, it's hilarious how many people just go, bloop, that's my password. <laughs> yeah. uh, when I was at uh, TopTal, the um, the CEO is kind of, you know, he's a character. Um, and, you know, he, he'd kind of go on rants at times. But somebody scammed the company. He was, he was on a, a flight or something. And somebody called one of the ladies in accounting. And claimed to be him and demanded, oh, no. yeah, demanded thirty five thousand dollars be wired. He's like, I'm in trouble. I need, I need thirty five grand wired to this bank account, like right she now. Are you wired? Yeah, they did it. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, it's like when being <laughs> dick fucking bites you. Yeah, and yeah, and then he, he, he sounded, it sounded like him. Did they find out? They must have known he was on that plane, or maybe they just got lucky in terms of the timing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think it was just kind of a middle of the night kind of thing. But yeah, I mean, That's somebody was somebody knew enough to uh, to get them pretty good. So there's another company I worked for where um, I would get email or I could get I would get text messages that were signed with the CEO's name. Like it would be like, "Hey, I need your help with something. You got a moment? You know, hyphen CEO's name." And you know, I, what I would do, because it would always originate from a weird number. And, of course, I had the CEO's phone number in my in my contacts. So I would screen grab it, and I would text it to the CEO with an LOL, all caps. <laughs> so, nice. <laughs> so, or, like, I would send, like, just so you're aware this is going on, you know? <laughs> so. Wow. You know you've made it in life when people are trying to scam off of your name. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> but you know that's it it's check the url like check the originating phone number if you know the actual person's phone number and that's not it you know yeah, like yeah. something is seriously wrong do you get those ones that are like um you be like hey bill or, or hey lucy you know I, I i'm sorry i'm late on my payment can i can i send you the check tomorrow something i have like gotten that. those yeah yeah you know, at first I'm like, no, you, you got to send the check somewhere else, lady. I'm not Bill. And then it's like, oh, well, I'm Angela, 22 from China. You know? <laughs> and then it's like send you a picture of like three Chinese girls, you know. We're just chilling. What are you doing? You know, <laughs> well, I, I'm pulling over. Hang on. <laughs> I'll be right there. <laughs> yeah. Let me know what flight to get on. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Yeah. She has really bad luck that her car keeps breaking down on the way to the airport. <laughs> but I got it fixed this time. I think she'll make it. <laughs> Wait, that one went a little over my head. I'll be honest. Oh, no. You know how catfishes work? Wait, how do we go? Like they're catfishing me? 
and their, her car keeps breaking down on the way to the airport, but I got it fixed. So I think she's going to come this time. Oh, I got it. <laughs> Cause I, I sent her the money to fix it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> money to get her car fixed. I know I've, I've gone through uh, many stages with them. Sometimes I like to kind of lead them on for a little while and think that maybe they have me. I did that when I was a kid. So like when I say kid, I mean like late teens, like I thought that was hilarious to, to basically, you know, like goad them like, you know, you get the South African Prince scam, right? Which is like the, you know, I, I was selling a laptop on eBay that wasn't worth $300. And somebody said to me, I'd like to give you $2,000 for that laptop. And I kind of fell for it. I was like, you know, just a kid. I'm like, oh, yeah, I would, you know, you know, give get sell this laptop for $2,000. I didn't know any better. You know, I'm like, yeah, sure. You know, like that's more money than I've ever seen in my life. And so, you know, I'm like ready to go with it. And um, they're like, all right, I need your bank account information to Western Union, you the money, you know, and I'm like, oh. And so I kind of figured it out, but like I, I kind of let it go for a while, just like you said, to, to sort of play with them a bit. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm sure most scam, like a lot of scams probably fall on children like that. Where, yeah. You know, it's. Yeah. Somewhat, yeah. I feel like it's our it's our duty to waste as much time as we can of theirs. <laughs> I don't think there's any other measure that can uh, you know th that can stop them. They're just getting more and more sophisticated. The only thing we can do is act interested and drag that shit off. Yeah. You know when they call for Viagra, I'm like, hell yeah! How much can I get for ten grand? <laughs> <laughs> they go wild. <laughs> Like uh, one moment, sir. <laughs> <laughs> How much can I get for ten grand? <laughs> like, baby, baby, the guy with the blue pills is calling. <laughs> yeah, they love it. You can that's do awesome. that. Yeah. Now that's that's, that's fun to me too. I um, I, I like I, I said. I mean, these days I feel like I just do not have the time. To, to stay on with a scammer, but there was a point in my life where I would, I would just enjoy, you know, dragging those interactions on as long as possible. I yeah. mean, I think some people get angry at telemarketers the same way, which I don't, you know, like I, I think my, my response to telemarketers has become, you know, it takes a lot of balls to be cold calling and I respect anyone that can do that, but I'm not interested in what you're selling. I'm sorry. And so, yeah. I'm like, yeah, take me off your list. I promise I'm never going to buy. Save your time. Yeah. And then they call me again. And they'll still like, hang up on you. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They still see that as a rejection, you know, which it is, but it's an honest rejection. I mean, if I were them and I heard that, I would be happy, but I, they've probably got somebody breathing down their neck, you know, under pain of death. You've got to hit this quota. And so they're probably just hoping they find somebody that's trying to blow through a pension fund or like, you know, yeah. but that's not all. I mean, I don't know. I mean, there probably are decent people that are that are working in outbound, you know, sales in that way. Like I do. I do cold outreach that ends up landing where I'm just like, here's all the stuff we do in 300 characters. Any interest, you know, like why yeah. can we talk? And like that seems to land like twenty to thirty percent of the time. But I think I do it from LinkedIn. I do it with my background. So if somebody looks me up, they're like, "Oh, <laughs> this guy clearly yeah, well, knows about robotics." And so yeah, I mean, ninety-nine percent of cold callers, I feel like, are all trying to jump in. Like I said, <clears throat> talking about themselves and their customer and, and their client, or talking about themselves and their company. Um versus calling somebody and like at the moment that they answer the phone they're broadcasting what they're all about in that moment which and is to a naive like, technique you know yeah and don't even don't even uh lead, don't lead at all with um, hey how's it are. going yeah just hop in to what you know and feel where they're coming from when they answer the phone listen to how they're talking and just jump right into it and be as honest as you can about so like, I got a lot of people to call, you know, the, I mean, I don't know if you want to say this all verbatim, you have to kind of find your own voice, but the idea is like, you know, I don't really want to call you, but I have to. And I have a lot of other people to call as well. I've got to call you all until you can give, until you give me an informed no. 
or something else happens. So what I'm hoping for at the very least is I get an informed no at the end of this 30 seconds. Right. And that way I can stop calling you and we can both move on with our own fucking lives. Right? <laughs> Say that. And I mean, you know, you're going to find your own in your own voice. But, you know, you, that's what those are the things you're trying to figure out when you're cold, when you're cold calling. And if you can just come through and meet the person where they're like, hello, you know, and you yeah. like just you just jump you vomit in at them. Yeah, you just go at it. Um, One of the best cold calls I ever got. And, and this this was a really good technique. And I kept the guy on the phone because I wanted to pick his brain on his sales tactic. Um, but I got one where the guy called me up and he goes, hi, this is Zach. And I go, hi, Zach. Um, you'll have to remind me, where do we know each other from? And he goes, oh, we don't know each other. I found you on LinkedIn. And I said, I really appreciate your honesty. <laughs> you know? yeah. Like, and, so, and then he had my ear and I, and I talked to him and I'm like, okay, so what are you selling? And he goes, well, you know, custom tailored suits. And I'm like, I'm not really in the market right now, but I'm intrigued but because you know, it's not very often someone can cold call me and I listen and I give them the time of day. So how, where'd you get that approach from? Tell me a little more about where you're coming from. Yeah. And I, I kind of just kept the guy on the line and, and talked to him about his sales approach and his business. And then I said, look, if I ever do need a custom tailored suit, I'll call you back. I kept his number. <laughs> so Yeah, right. And just being honest, like this is it. I found you on LinkedIn. You don't know me. I'm calling you. Right. They're all those verifiable facts, right? Yeah, that is true. Yeah, what, what else? You know, <laughs> to the point, you don't want it. He doesn't have to waste his time with you. I think that it's like what people don't realize. Same, same we see it in emails. Everybody's going with the same messaging, the same cadence. Like there's certain like 10 minute blocks, like three or four of them throughout the day where I get so many marketing emails, right? Could some algorithm determine like, oh, between 9.52 and 10.08 and Tuesdays and Wednesdays is the time to send your mail. And now all of the mail comes through in these different blocks throughout the day. Yeah, I noticed yeah. that. Like, it really comes through on the weekdays, like, more so than on the weekends. Yeah, they get it all. You know, they're all optimized for viewing. And, like, how, how often do you get an email or a random phone call? It's like, oh, like, all the time you get, you get a, a number and it's just a phone number with no... Uh, you know, n no ID. How often does that turn into something that, you know, was not well, great? Well, here's the thing is, is my parents blocked their phone number for my whole childhood. So every time I got a phone number with no ID, I'm like, oh, that might be my parents. <laughs> <laughs> Are they probably calling from an undisclosed location? Yeah, yeah, that was that was their thing. I mean, so I think it's because my dad's a physician. And so I think he would call his patients and he didn't want them being able to call him back and waste his time. And yeah. so, you know, he, he just by default blocked his phone number. Smart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can imagine. I used to work at a call center and we'd answer the phone for physicians who had patients that didn't all need to talk to him. <laughs> yeah. So you're an answering service. Yeah, exactly. Right. An answering service. Yeah. And so, man, it, just the calls you'd get for people and they're like, fucking hypochondriac worries like we need to call the doctor and it's like okay control f for the faqs like hmm, let's see do we call for fucking nervous people no sorry yeah we're not going to reach them tonight uh uh yeah it was great it was a great a great cross-section of society answering for like attorneys and bail bondsmen and doctors <laughs> and nephrologists and the jail and attorneys you know you, you get calls like you know like two in the morning, I was working graveyard shifts. It's like you get a call for a nephrologist. That's like the cop calls a nephrologist to do a blood test on somebody on the side of the road or at the jailhouse because they refuse to do a breathalyzer. And then it's like by the end of the shift, you're getting a call from the bail bondsman place saying, you know, <laughs> from the same same case. That we're trying to get out of jail now. Six hours later. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. pretty funny. Yeah, I got. It. Yeah, it was fun. Got written yeah. up a couple of times for you, know, you. You have to read these uh, these messages back verbatim, <laughs> and so on occasion. And, and as I say, you give you have a lot of power. Like if somebody if somebody says something in poor English, 
you know, most of the time we would correct it so that the message would be translated <laughs> correctly. To, but to if their someone, intent. Right, yeah. But if someone was a dickhead and they misspoke, it was fully within our purview to write literally what they what they said. <laughs> And that was how we could kind of fuck with people that fucked with us. And, uh, and I, I, yeah, I was delivering a message to a doctor in the middle of the night. I, I won't repeat what the medical condition was, but we'll suffice to say that at the end of it, I let out a little chuckle. <laughs> the next day, boss comes in. He's like, Aaron, can I come, come see me in my office? And, uh, yeah. <laughs> but it's like, it's like, a quarter sized piece of poop. <laughs> <laughs> Just with repeating that little phrase that I had uh, delivered from this message. <laughs> Why did I get you written up, though, if that's what the patient said? Well, because of the chuckle. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, deadpan. Yeah. <laughs> Who's the yeah. Yeah. We we answered the phone for a, like a pretty high end uh, massage therapy place, and yes. yes, oh man, after ten o'clock you get so many calls because it was twenty four hour answering, but not actually a twenty four hour massage place. Oh, interesting. Yes, you get calls, guys. Like, yeah, what kind of massage can I get? Uh, like, uh, we're booking for like next Thursday. You know, one hundred and twenty an hour kind of massage, and they're looking for like a right now. Yeah. Uh, Happy ending. Yeah, I figured as much. <laughs> yeah. That was great. A great job. That's hilarious. Like 125 an hour next Thursday kind of massage. <laughs> so is there anything you took away from working at that call center that you still use today? Like, I mean, I, I feel well, like jobs like that. What's that? Yeah, I'll say 100%, man. Um, I had this trainer. Uh, named Constance. Like, so the, the place was in uh, Oakland, Berkeley area. And my call trainer, so I, I worked in the call center for about a year, year and a half. Then I went on to become a programmer. But I went through like the training for the, for the call center and she taught us call control. And I'll say that there is like, there is no training I've ever received than this woman Constance provided. And, and she's basically explained that when you go onto a call, you have to know exactly what the call is, what's going to happen. And then you direct the call, like with an iron fist in a velvet glove. And, and you direct the call, unless the other person is going to like upstage you and take control of the call. That's fine too, as long as you're getting your objectives accomplished and like understanding that we have leverage. So when somebody wants something, you can get what you want in exchange for it, right? If someone calls you and says, how much is it going to cost to make a, you know, a dog robot, you know, and you're like, um, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of questions I have to follow up on that. <laughs> uh, yep. <laughs> having the call control to kind of uh, direct the people. So they want to know how much it costs. It's going to cost to get a dog robot. And you want to know what is your name and what is your email address? How did you hear from me? Uh, what's the background in your in your uh, company or your personal interest in domestic pet robots, you know, et cetera, and getting all the questions that you need answered. As soon as you give them the call for a dog robot, the guy's the guy has no reason to stay on the call with you anymore. Right? He's oh, got interesting. The, he's got the line item for his presentation to his buddies at the HOA. Guys, we gotta throw our money in, get a fucking dog robot. Um Right. As soon as you and we give can send like, it to anyone, it doesn't matter if it's SKA or not. Correct. This is what correct. they cost. So we would deal with this because so what was cool about the call center was that we only, I mean, almost, almost entirely dealing with irate customers. At the very least, you're dealing with customers that are so off-putting that their clients or that the people that they're calling would rather pay us a buck twenty a minute to take the calls for them. <laughs> right? You're not fucking. Oh, Bill, how's it going? You know, how are the kids? It's like fucking people with problems. That's interesting. Right? And so, so by having the call control, understanding they want to talk to the doctor, it's like great. Let me just get a little bit of information, and we'll see what we can do. And then, anytime anything that they want to fucking balk at in the process, it's like, well, you said you wanted to talk to the doctor. I'm just trying to help you get what you want. Oh, that's you know? interesting. So it's not, it's always about trying well, as soon as they tell you what they want. Now you're just doing everything in service of that, including 
you know, getting the contract signed, getting them to put the deposit down, all the different, you know, processes. Once, once you've got it locked in what it is they're going for. And then um, I'll say the thing that she taught me, I, I rarely have to use it anymore, but the phrase she taught us was uh, when somebody is getting pissed off at you or that they're, they're angry, you know, to go back to like the irate customer, you know, thing um, you say, what I can do is help you as best that I can in this situation. But what I can't do is have you speak to me in that tone any longer. I mean, you, you, but you have to bust that out to somebody. <laughs> it's an amazing thing. They will just melt. Like, I'm really sorry, dude. Like none of this matters, you know, I'm, you know, blah, blah, blah. That's amazing. Uh, but yeah. It's a great line. Uh, just you know, what I can do is help you as best as I can in this situation. What I can't do is have you speak to me in that tone. That's it, right? Yeah. And what I can do is get you a price for your dog robot prototype. Yeah. But what I can't do is get you that until I get my questions answered. Right. So that way you're not he, fucking sitting dreaming of dog robots while this guy has no skin in the game at all. And you want to make sure before your brain, which can do the heavy lifting for any of your team. Before any time is invested in that, this person has been vetted so that you know that they're at the very least worth, worth your time and that they could pay for the dog robot and they should pay for the dog robot, right? It's not just some fucking dude whose grandma left him 50 grand and he really wants one. It's like <laughs> I mean, it's a company that makes fucking laser beams for sharks and they're looking for a different platform on a dog, you know, or <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and so, and, and so using that, um, you know, leverage point and being able to direct how the process goes, right? If anyone ever balks at why is your process going that way, it's always because you're the expert and this is the way that works best. Always, you see, you always fall back on. Yeah. Because you're always going to know more than your client for the most part. Not always, but well, always about, about yeah, certain things. You, at least. Yeah. Sorry. Well, like I said, I really like having smart clients that, that are capable of solving these problems themselves, but want them solved by somebody equally competent. Like that is, that is my favorite kind of client is, is the ones that, you know, you've mutual respect for. And you're like, you know, absolutely. I know you yeah. know how to do this, but you're asking me to do it. So I'm going to do a really good job for you. Yeah, and I, I don't mean to say um, always the case, and I'll say really the expertise you're bringing is how to peel off parts of development to be done kind of at, in a siloed situation, where it's like letting the uh, the internal team work on where their expertise is and then peel off things that you can handle. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. What are you drinking, by the way? Oh, uh, just just some water. Nice. I've been, uh, yeah, I've been not drinking alcohol for several weeks now. Congratulations. That's awesome. Yeah, just trying it. Uh, yeah, I'm just not. I mean, yeah, it wasn't really any planned uh, thing, but so far, so good. Nice. I am yeah. drinking alcohol, but uh, also water. Have one for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's definitely been moments where I'm like, why am I making this decision? It's like I just slammed like most of a half of a pecan pie in the parking lot in my truck. You know, is this <laughs> is this really worse than uh, drinking six tall boys? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I go off and on, but like when I when I do have someone on the podcast that doesn't want to drink, um, you know. I probably would have would have forgone this had I known you you wouldn't be having alcohol, but that's okay. Oh no, because, yeah, you know I I'm enjoying drinking alcohol, but also enjoying you know that you know I I don't need to like every now and then you know I I, I do one of these where I don't drink. It's it's very rare. Uh, but yeah, big takeaways: call center for anybody that's going to seriously consider a job on the phone. I'll say the advice that was given to me when I was a younger person, uh, a mentor of mine said, get a job working at a call center, see what it's like taking hundreds of calls a day where most people are not happy to be talking to you and learn how, because the, the nice thing about being on the phone, which 
I'll say it's it's gotten less true as we do video more. But the nice thing, we have auditory, visual, and kinesthetic cues that we're working with, that we represent the world with. And the more that we share with people, the more we can kind of relate. When we're on a phone, though, all we really have is the auditory channel. Oh, that's and interesting. Be, and so you can really be, you can really like hone in on just that auditory channel, which is nice for me. It's like, I like to work in any number of situations, you know, it's lonely out here in space. Um, <laughs> but, but um, you know, being able to kind of bring the voice to the call, it doesn't really matter what you're doing or where you're at, uh, which I really appreciate about the phone. Now, with Zoom and stuff now be kind of becoming the, the primary thing people are using. I'll say when possible, I like to just do phone calls. I feel like people also appreciate like finally I can take a call without having to, Wear you know, pants. get get out of my yeah, work from home uh, gear <laughs> or get get into my office pants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that makes sense to me. Well, I haven't done that job, but the job that I did that I feel like everyone should have to do at some point in their lives is working in the restaurant industry. I feel like that is it is character building. Um, I I remember being on a date with a person who was just a tremendous jerk to, to the wait staff at a restaurant we were at. I'm thinking you wouldn't do that if you've ever worked in a restaurant, you know, and so I feel like empathy, I think, is is kind of the defining trait here that's common between those 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 jobs you know understanding how to meet people where they're at and varying human perspectives i I, correct me if i'm wrong here no i totally agree i mean being able to just kind of show up and uh yeah meet them where they're at and just communicate effectively without like stepping on toes and just kind of giving them you know the direction this is how you get rid of me. This is how we go in some other direction. Yeah, that makes sense and, to me. Yeah, and like rely, rely on um, on people to sort themselves out. Right? Can you can you go a little deeper into what that means? Like by being by being who you are, being authentic and honest and transparent, you're going to cut right through. And all the people that have any beef or problem with that are going to kind of fall by the wayside. You know, assume that you've got that you've got it going on that they're going to want you, um, and let them opt out. And the thing, then you'll find people that are really believing in uh, in you and what you're talking about, what you're offering, etc. And it's the easiest possible way to be where you're not, you're not fronting. You're not, um, you know, trying to play some role or, or become off any other way, but just like seeing, okay, where is this person at? I think cold calling really is such a fun thing for that, for that purpose, this kind of game of calling someone and listening to the way they say hello and trying to like guess how their days go. Oh, that's interesting. Well, like, I, I had I knew that my old landlord. He'd be like, "Hey, Aaron, how you doing?" And if I was like, "Oh, I'm really good, dude. How are you?" He would like get physically repulsed by that. <laughs> he had a shitty day. He always had a shitty day. Every and single when, day. And other people that had good days, he fucking hates them, right? So then I, I changed it. So he, goes, "Hey, Aaron, how you doing?" And I'd say. I'm barely keeping my head above water. How you doing? And they'd be like, oh, man, just struggling. All right, boom. Give him a <laughs> pump, and we move along down down the road. You oh, know? that's awesome. And then another story I'll share with regard to kind of having people identify themselves. So like my first real sales job where I'm cold calling, um, I had to call. I got a list of like 500 small businesses in the area. I had to call and offer them websites. This is like 2008, 2009. So a lot of people had websites. A lot of people didn't have websites. It was kind of a, you know, a second wave or third wave website gold rush at the time. And so what I figured out by researching all the companies was that some of the companies had awesome websites and there were, they weren't going to be interested in getting a website from me. Some of the companies didn't have a website 
And it was 2009. If they didn't have a website, they probably didn't want a fucking website. And then the third group of people had a website, but it was shitty. And those people saw the value in a website, but had not upgraded to the next version. You know, what? think about the way websites change from like 98 to 2008. Yeah, every five they, years, you know, there's right, a different yeah. way to do it. So, yeah, exactly. So they hadn't taken the last quantum leap or two. So those people, I could close them at a much higher rate than the other two. Oh, well, that's so interesting. I, yeah. So, so V1 of my sales process, I researched a bunch of people, figured out who had shitty websites qualitatively, according to me, right? And then called those people, right? Well, version, so I did great, right? I was getting like nine meetings a day at one point. My, the goal was three. Um, but then <laughs> what I figured out, I just call everybody on the list and they answer the phone and be like, hey, Spencer, I'm looking at your website and I'll be honest, it's kind of shitty. <laughs> and you would say either, no, I just had it redone last year and it's badass. Or you say, what are you talking about? I don't have a website. Or you'd say, yeah, you're right. It is kind of shitty. <laughs> and if, if it was the first two, I'd be like, I'm sorry, my bad and hang up. And if it was the third, I'd be like, that's why I'm calling Spencer. And, you know, I just... <laughs> I cut all of the research out, assumed that I was calling somebody with a shitty website, and just <laughs> optimized the process for that. That's interesting. So you just go to the most sales qualified option, assume it every time, and then you're spending less time in research. Yeah, and just calling. Yeah, and, then, and it was fun. You know, I mean, it, it, when, you, when you can start to have fun by calling someone and telling them that their website is shitty. But you're not even they, looking at it. You're just... <laughs> You're I'm like, oh, wow, yeah. I, I feel pretty stupid there, Spencer. My bad. You know, I know take all the responsibility. I'm an idiot. I am so embarrassed. Good day. Call, you know, call the next person. Hey, I'm looking at your website. It's it's kind of shitty. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I've been meaning to get it done. It's like, well, I could have a guy come out Friday morning and give you an estimate. You know, easy. E the easiest sale ever when they when they admit that their website is shitty. Because that was the strongest pitch. It's like, so you know you should have a website, but you have no option for updating it right now. Let me be your guy. That's awesome. Yeah. So, uh, so and then, nine and, calls a day, like how many of those were conversions? You know, I don't even know, man. It was such a shit show at the time. I, <laughs> I, was, I was a young guy, and the guys that ran the company were younger than me. And um, I definitely know that, a lot of the early morning meetings that I set were routinely missed. Um, you know, I say, the, I know the feeling. Yeah. So that when I when I quit that job, the CEO and the CEO started laughing, and he said to me, "We can't believe you made it this long." <laughs> <laughs> that, my, I did. I got nine dollars an hour after three meetings a day. I got a shot of Jack Daniels. <laughs> Yeah, not a great job. That was your incentive, was a shot of Jack Daniels. Yeah. Yeah, it was terrible. Yeah, that's that's amazing. But, uh, yeah, so what, what I, that's funny. When I uh, when I went, I applied for the job, I didn't get it, actually. And uh, it was like, I, I had never even seen the movie to even get the reference. But at the time, I was just kind of confused when he handed me the pen, and he's like, sell me this pen. Right. I, I, I fucking never done sales in my life. I, if I had just seen the movie, I would have had a better response. But I fumbled through it, didn't get the job. He's like, yeah, sorry. So then I'm out a few nights later, and I run into a buddy, and he actually got the job. And he's like, yeah, I got hired for this company. Um, they want me to start Tuesday morning, but I'm not going to go. So I fucking went down to the office. I was there at 7 in the morning. And uh, fucking three hours at 10 a.m. they showed up. And the guy's like, what are you doing here, man? We told you you didn't get the job. <laughs> and then, well, I, I ran into this guy, and he said he got the job, but he wasn't going to show up, so I came to uh, see if I could have it. And then if I can drink a whole bunch of Jack Daniels for like eight weeks, <laughs> decided sales was definitely for me. That's awesome. <laughs> that was your first sales job. Yeah, that was. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah, yeah. $9 an hour. <laughs> I've never done like a proper sales job except selling my own business. So I feel like it's an interesting career line. I always wonder, you know, what it's like to do that as, as a dedicated professional. 
So. Yeah. Well, it's funny. They've actually, I'm really into like personality types Yeah. and um, they've done a, a pretty well-respected sales, uh, I don't know, think tank kind of thing or whatever, um, put out a study where they, they looked at, there's really two kinds of salespeople they looked at appointment setters and closers, right? The sales development oh, people, interesting. the account executives, right? So a lot of times for agencies, it's one person doing that as they, you know, as you might get more sophisticated, you might hire people to set meetings for you kind of thing. But in most organizations, once you get to a certain level of maturity and sophistication, you'll have a team of people setting appointments for a team of people that are closing deals. Oh, that's really interesting. Right. So that's a critical difference. And then so from a personality perspective, right, there's one type of person that is both top tier sales closer as well as top tier um, sales development person, appointment center. One of the issues I think any, any anybody in sales management can appreciate this issue is that when people are closers, when they can be closers and they get a job doing sales development, all they want to do is jump up to become a closer and get out of setting appointments. Well, that's interesting. But, yeah, right. And that's the kind of person that's like dog and pony show, high energy, lots of charisma, personal power, emotional intelligence, right? That's the like traditional sales person, right? Like Obama, you know, he's like a perfect example, right? But on, And they're the best both for closing deals as well as for setting appointments. But on the setting appointment side, there's also another type of personality that's more of an introverted person that's huh. more like quiet and like hardworking and, and uh, you know, into like studious and industrious and orderly. Those are the type of people I find that are when you can find them, they're gold because they don't have aspirations of ever having to take over the job of closing the deal. Right. But they can stay on task. And a lot of sales development is repetitive tasks and they, they feel comfort. In like, and, and as I say, engineers it doesn't take a lot really to transition because they feel comfort in this sort of like, here's the guidelines, boom, 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 get it done. And also being introverted, they're calling people who don't really want to be bothered and they themselves know they don't really like to get bothered. <laughs> to, your, to your point about empathy. And so they can really, tra hey man, I, can, I don't mean to bother you. I'll be really quick, you know, and, and like really be able to meet the people understanding full well what it means to be bothered the other type of salesperson they don't really know what it's like to be bothered they're the ones usually doing the bothering <laughs> yeah, and, and it works it works in a sales context but on the appointment setting especially i think relevant to agencies it's difficult to find people of that kind of uh personality type the kind of quiet like creative type um but if you can get one to set appointments for you they are worth their weight in gold that's amazing yeah. Yeah. That's well, one of the one of the things we use to kind of, you know, help suss out candidates for sales teams. How do how do you determine um or how do you I guess convey to a person like that if, if a candidate is sales qualified? So like should you even be setting an appointment? Do you pre qualify? Do you do it in the call? I'm assuming with that personality type it's a pre qualification research problem. No. So, I mean, when you're doing outbound, it's a different, it's, it's kind of a different situation, right? Inbound is like someone knocks on your door. Do you answer it or not? Right. You're going to answer it in cases you're running a business. You need to make sure you don't let them into the, the foyer unless they've got a you know valid reason of being there. But when you're doing outbound, you're going to go knock on people's doors. And so the most important thing about effective outbound strategy at the, at the outset is understanding which doors are most likely to have people, <clears throat> excuse me, which doors are most likely to have people behind them that should use the service and could use the service, right? That's the game. You know, there's a lot of doors to knock on. I only have so many knocks in a day. How do I reduce the number of doors that I'm knocking in on to the doors most likely to lead to somebody interested to talk to me? Right. And I think also breaking down things in terms of like, I'm going to go knocking on doors. I'm hoping to close a deal. Right. That's skipping so many steps. We get thinking about it in terms of like, I'm going to go knock on some doors. I'm hoping somebody has a conversation with me. Oh, that's interesting. Right. And then it's like, I'm going to have a bunch of conversations. I hope someone gives me a spec. Right. And, and kind of acknowledging that people come in, there's a, there's a process that people take. Yeah. And you kind of got to go from one to the next. 
And and the goal of knocking on doors isn't necessarily to close deals. I mean, it is down the line, but it's the first to have a conversation. And in that conversation, you are going to lay out the landmines for them to blow themselves up on by not having money or not really having any real business case for coming to use you or, you know, thought you were some other Spencer or, you know what I mean? Like figuring out how to eliminate the people that are not, you know, again, most. Yep. Yep. And then what you're left with is, you know, the, uh, the good stuff. The idea being, uh, you know, the, the funnel of the margarita glass versus the champagne flute. Margarita glass funnels is like appeal to everybody and disqualify a lot of people. So a very few number of people become clients, right? From the many to the few. Yep. Whereas the champagne flute, it's like you want to keep most of your people in the funnel to come all the way through. You want to make sure you're not even putting them into the funnel unless you've determined that they're qualified, right? They spend, they're, they're not looking for like a $1,500 gadget, right? Or they're, you know, that's something you might refer to somebody else that specializes in that kind of thing, let's say. Yeah. Uh, or they're not looking for a mobile app or, or whatnot, right? Uh, and they, you know, you, you qualify them at that point, they're in the funnel. You have a process by which you uh, manage their expectations about, you know, if they do decide they want it, how far in advance do they need to call you? If they have any other questions or hesitations, how do they get them addressed? You know, and when do they expect you to call back if you haven't heard anything? Yeah, right. Makes sense. Yeah, those kinds of things worked out. <clears throat> uh, but yeah, the the worst thing you can do as a salesperson is spend time with people that are not qualified. Yeah, it's better off taking a walk. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. So I think that's probably a good note to end on. Is there anything you want to plug or kind of leave the audience with? Well, something that I'm working on with a partner of mine. Um, we're getting together. I've done a lot of work with owners of agencies, uh, helping them kind of hone their sales skills, both, you know, on the call and in the sales process, as well as working on infrastructure, automation, things like that. Um, that's kind of my the meat and potatoes of my business. Um, starting the, in the next year, we'll be doing a once a month group coaching call. Okay. We're getting a bunch of agencies. Again, most of the clients I work with are in the software development space. Um, but really, it applies the same kind of process in taking clients, qualifying them, et cetera, applies across the board to agencies and most importantly to owner operators of agencies that are, you know, the executive and the salesperson and the manager and everything. That's the type of people that I like to work with the most because I know the goal is make a lot of money, but also free up more of your time to be able to do the other things you want to do in your life. Um so yeah, if there's any interest, uh, my uh, Aaron at Interest Corp is my email address. Um, yeah, it's been awesome talking with you, hey, Spencer. Good talking uh, with you, Aaron. Thanks for coming on. Yeah. Email Aaron at Interest Corp if you're interested in a group uh, sales coaching call and um, or just general uh, consulting if you're an agency owner. And Aaron, thank you for coming on. You're very welcome. Take care. Take care. Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you on the next one.